All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Jess. I am a reference librarian with the St. Louis County Library, and today we are going to be discussing Toni Morrison. I do want to give a disclaimer right up front that we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy stuff today, including slavery and the deaths of both children and adults. So please know yourself and what you're comfortable with. So in terms of what we are going to talk about today, we are going to start with an overview of Toni Morrison and her accomplishments as a writer. We're then going to talk about her childhood and education, as well as her careers in teaching and publishing. We'll then discuss some of her more prominent novels and dive into some of the criticism surrounding her work before looking at some of the many awards that she has won. Finally, we'll talk about her impact and legacy in both the literary world and the world in general. And even with all of this, there are so many um, nuances and other topics in her life that we just won't have time to cover, unfortunately. So Toni Morrison was born in 1931 and died in 2019. She was a prolific American writer. She is known as one of the best writers in the world and transformed what literature could do. She wrote 11 novels, as well as several nonfiction books, children's books, and more. But she's best known for her novels. Her books primarily examine Black identity and Black experiences in America. And her writing was really a catalyst for Black literature to be nationally and internationally recognized. Many credit her for being the one who brought Black writing to the rest of the world. She truly changed the literary landscape with what she did, and she earned countless prestigious awards for her books. So Tony's novels span four centuries worth of time. Her books focus on Black American people and their individual experiences throughout different points in history. Her books show the consequences of everyday racism, the trauma and joy of Black life, and how history affects future generations. She focused particularly on Black women in her writing, and she writes in this almost poetic style while also weaving in myth and magical realism. So her writing is this incredible mix of being lyrical and eloquent and powerful, and her writing really forces you to slow down and focus on the words every word matters. It's not something that you can just kind of fly through in an afternoon. Her writing is something that takes time and effort to read, but it is so, so worth it. Her books were both critical and commercial successes. Um, she certainly had her critics and her naysayers, which we'll discuss. But her novels appeared regularly on the New York Times bestseller list, were featured multiple times on Oprah's Book Club, and have been the subject of various critical studies throughout time. So now we're going to go back to the very beginning. Morrison was born on February 18th in 1931 as Chloe Ardelia Wofford. And we'll talk about this name change later. But I'm going to refer to her as either Tony or Morrison, just because it's easier for me to keep it straight in my brain. So she was born in Lorain, Ohio. And at this time, Lorain was a thriving steel town of about 75,000 people. As you can see here, this top picture shows um, picture of their like, downtown Main Street um, several years after she was born. And then we also have an image of steel mills from an overhead view. So this town was full of European immigrants from Poland and Italy, as well as a growing Black population. So this is a multicultural area. And in a later interview, Morrison said that she really didn't have a strong awareness of segregation until she left Lorraine because of the semi-integration. The residents of Lorraine were primarily in the poor labor class. And in future interviews, Morrison spoke fondly of Lorraine in general and described it as a calm town. She was also heavily influenced by the women in the community. So here's a quote that Morrison said, we were taught that as individuals, we had value irrespective of what the future might hold for us. The women of the Black community, whether aunt, grandmother, or neighbor, served as a tightly woven safety net. Morrison's parents also played a large role in her life. Her parents were Rama and George Wofford. Both of her parents migrated to Ohio from the Deep South as children. 
Her mother, Rama, was born in Greenville, Alabama, where she lived there with her mother and her sisters. Um, Rama's father had gone to Birmingham to make money for the family, but Rama's mother ended up flooding the, um, the state of Alabama with Rama and her sisters in the middle of the night after she felt threatened by white men, and she ended up in Ohio, where their father later joined them. And then Morrison's father, George, grew up in Carlosville, Georgia, and when he was 15, he saw a group of white people lynch two black businessmen who lived on his street. So soon after this lynching, he and his parents moved to Lorraine, Ohio. And George was extremely traumatized by his experiences of racism, and he remained deeply suspicious of white people all of his life. Morrison's father was a very active and supportive presence in her life. In fact, Morrison wouldn't go back home for three years after his death just because he wasn't there. In terms of her parents' careers, Morrison's mother, Rama, worked primarily at home and was a member of the African Episcopal Church. It's a historically Black church, and she sang in the church choir. Then we have George, who worked in the steel industry and had various jobs, one of which was as a shipyard welder. And Morrison described her father as a perfectionist and as someone who was very proud of his work. And Morrison said, I remember my daddy taking me aside. This is when he worked as a welder and telling me that he welded a perfect seam that day and that after welding the perfect seam, he put his initials on it. I said, Daddy, no one will ever see that. Sheets and sheets of siding would go over that, you know? And he said, yes, but I'll know it's there. Morrison was the second of four children. She had an older sister named Lois and then two younger brothers named Raymond and George Carl. Morrison was raised in close proximity to her grandparents on her mother's side, and she was also very close to her great-grandmother, who she really considered to be an almost mythical person. Tony's family was very poor, and this meant that they often moved around a lot because they could not afford rent. Um, her family moved six times in total when she was a child. And although Tony and her family lived in a semi-integrated area, racial discrimination was still a constant threat that they faced. When Morrison was two years old, the owner of her family's apartment building set their home on fire while they were all inside because they couldn't pay the rent, which was $4 per month. Thankfully, everyone was okay, and Morrison later talked about how her family laughed at the incident because they couldn't deal with such absurd cruelty any other way. The Tony's family had a very intense love of and appreciation for Black culture. Her parents instilled a sense of heritage and language through tr telling traditional African-American folk tales, ghost stories, and singing songs. So her house was filled with all this narrative and superstition, and Tony especially loved listening to ghost stories. Those were her favorite. The Wofford house was also filled with music. Her grandfather played the violin by ear, and then her mother played the piano and was constantly singing for hours on end. Reading was also very prevalent in the Wofford household. Morrison's father often bragged about reading the Bible five times from cover to cover. This was the only book that he could read because it was illegal for him to know how to read when he was young as he was born into slavery. Morrison was taught how to read when she was three years old by her older sister, Lois. And Morrison and her sister would go outside and write words with pebbles on the sidewalk to practice their writing and their words. Morrison loved reading and read often. Some of her favorite authors when she was young were Jane Austen and Leo Tolstoy. So Tony was recognized as a talented student from a young age. In an interview, Morrison recalled that when she began school at the age of five, she was one of the few children who could actually read. In middle school, one of her teachers sent her home with a note urging her parents to ensure she went to college because she just had so much promise. Morrison attended a Catholic school and converted to Catholicism when she was 12, and then she was baptized under the name Anthony. So her name was changed to Chloe Anthony Wofford, and Anthony was the nickname, or was the seed for the nickname in the future, Tony. And in school, she joined the debate team, yearbook staff, and drama club. Her sister Lois got a job at the Lorraine Public Library, where Tony later got a job as well. Um, but in a later interview, Tony said that she wasn't very good at her job because she would keep reading the books instead of shelving them. 
So for college, Morrison decided that she wanted to attend a historically Black college. Her parents worked additional jobs to financially support her education. It definitely was not easy for them to send her to college. But in 1949, Tony moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University. And this is when she started calling herself Tony because her teachers always mispronounced Chloe and her classmates thought the name Chloe was strange. It really just wasn't as common of a name then. And Tony also said that she later regretted the name change. Her family always called her Chloe all throughout her life. And while she was in college, Morrison experienced racial segregation in a new way and was truly stunned by the racial atmosphere. So at this point in time in Washington, D.C., the buses were still segregated. There was only one department store in the area that let Black people use the bathroom. And there was also a caste system, which categorized students according to the lightness or darkness of their skin, um, both at Howard and at surrounding schools in the area. And Tony told various stories about her time in college. She would steal um, white and colored signs and send them home to her mother. At one point, she asked to write a paper on Black characters in Shakespeare, but the English department was incredibly alarmed by this and did not let her write the paper. And Morrison said, the closer you got to whiteness, even at a Black school, was better. However, the community at Howard allowed her to make connections with other writers, artists, and activists. She joined the university's theatrical group called the Howard Players, which was a defining experience of her life. The group frequently visited the South to perform, where she experienced even more racism there. Morrison loved the Howard Players and the drama department in general. She also joined a sorority that was for Black women. And at this time, she really got into baking. She loved baking and became known for having the best carrot cake that anyone has ever tasted. She graduated in 1953 with a Bachelor of Arts in English and then a minor in Classics. And Tony was very aware of her working class background and the upward mobility that was granted to her through her education. She said, had I not gone to college, had I lived the life that the state planned for me from the beginning, I would have lived and died in somebody else's kitchen or somebody else's land and never written a word. That knowledge is bone deep and it informs everything I do. So after graduating with her bachelor's degree in 1953, she then went on to Cornell University to pursue a master's degree in English. Um, around this time, she also decided that she wanted to teach English. So she graduated from Cornell in 1955 with a Master of Arts in English. And then I came across a quote from a letter that Morrison sent to her thesis professor um, more than a decade after she graduated. And she said, Cornell was the first place in my life where I was treated as a human being. Nobody considered my stupidities Negro stupidities. I was welcomed there into the human race and good or ill, I have been there ever since. Now that I think was progress. So after she graduated in 1955, she began teaching at Texas Southern University, a historically black institution in Houston. Morrison said little about this time in her life, so we don't know too much. She taught there for two years before she returned to Howard University, where she went for undergrad in 1957 as a faculty member. And it was at Howard that she joined a fiction writing workshop. She was required to bring a writing sample to each workshop meeting. So she started out by bringing samples that she had written in school. But when she ran out of writing from school, she began working on a story about a, about a young black girl who craves blue eyes. And this would end up being the kernel of her first novel. Um, when Tony was teaching at Howard, she met her husband, Harold Morrison. and He was an architect from Jamaica. They got married in 1958 and had two children together, Harold Ford Morrison and Slade Morrison. Um, after six years of marriage, Tony and Harold got divorced in 1964. And she was actually pregnant with their second child, Slade, at that time. Morrison rarely spoke about um, her marriage or addressed the causes for her divorce. But after um, they got divorced, Morrison left Washington, D.C. with Ford and Slade on the way to live with her parents in Ohio. 
As they grew older, her sons continued to have a relationship with their father, and they frequently visited him in Jamaica uh, after he moved back there permanently in the 1960s. Harold Ford followed in his father's footsteps and became an architect, and Slade was a musician and a painter who actually co-authored a series of children's books with Toni Morrison. Sadly, Slade died of pancreatic cancer in 2010 when he was 45 years old. And Tony became very depressed and stopped writing for a few years during this time. Eventually, she finished the book that she had been working on called Home, and she dedicated it to Slade. So in 1965, uh, while back at her parents' house after her divorce, Tony saw an advertisement for a job opening in Syracuse, New York. The opening was for an editor in the textbook division of L.W. Singer, which was a subsidiary of Random House. So Tony went to New York to interview, and she got the job. So Morrison moved with her sons to Syracuse and became her, began her job as a textbook editor. Within two years, Random House bought L.W. Singer, and Random House took everyone they wanted to keep with them to New York City. So just a couple of years later, in 1968, Tony and her sons moved to New York City, where she became an editor with Random House. And here she started editing fiction and nonfiction books rather than textbooks. She was eventually promoted to senior editor, and she was the first Black woman to achieve that rank at a major publishing house. And she held this post for nearly two decades. Tony's career in editing and publishing is very impressive. When she became an editor in 1971, about 95% of the fiction published by the big publishing houses were by white authors. So she primarily focused on work by Black authors and wanted to focus on amplifying Black voices. She worked with a large number of influential writers, including Angela Davis, Gail Jones, Tony K. Bambara, and Muhammad Ali. And Tony was committed to helping open these industry doors to writers of color. And she truly did it all in this editing department. She was editing books, designing covers, and she did the marketing. She also very much recognized her worth and fought for it. She told a story in an interview about realizing that men in the company got more money than women when raises were given because they were considered to be the heads of the household. So she went to her boss to confront him and argue that she was the head of her household and therefore deserved a raise as well. And she got it. And Morrison said, I look very hard for Black fiction because I want to participate in developing a canon of Black work. We've had the first rush of Black entertainment where Blacks were writing for whites and whites were encouraging this kind of self-flagellation. Now we can get down to the craft of writing where black people are talking to black people. So Tony somehow managed to write between working and being a single mom of two young children. It really was an outlet for her when she first came to New York because she was lonely. So she started by focusing on the short story that she had written in the Howard Writing Workshop group. But she tried to hide that she was writing while she worked at Random House. In a future interview, a colleague of hers recalled that Tony once asked her to do some typing for her in exchange for one of her carrot cakes. And looking back, the colleague realizes that they were typing part of Tony's first novel. So you can see down here at the bottom in this picture are some early drafts of The Bluest Eye. She would always handwrite all of her drafts before transferring them um, to a typewriter or a computer. Tony really struggled to find a publisher for her book, though, and she was rejected from 12 publishing houses before she was finally accepted. And her first novel, The Bluest Eye, was published in 1970 when she was 39 years old. It had a pretty modest initial print run of 2,000 copies and an interesting cover. So you can see here, this is kind of the book if it was um, splayed out flat on a table. So it features the opening paragraphs of the novel on the front cover and then has a picture of Tony on the back cover. 
The Bluest Eye is about a young Black girl who is obsessed with white standards of beauty and longs to have blue eyes because she thinks that this will make others love her. Abuse and racism play a very large role in shaping the life of the protagonist, Pecola. This book was inspired by a conversation Tony had um, way back when she was walking with a friend when she was just 11 years old. And her friend was convinced that God didn't exist because she had been praying for years for blue eyes and never received them. And Tony felt compelled to write this book because she had never read anything centering young Black girls before. She said, I wrote the first book because I wanted to read it. I thought that kind of book with that subject, the most vulnerable, most undescribed, not taken seriously little Black girls had never existed seriously in literature. No one had ever written about them except as props. Since I couldn't find a book that did that, I thought, well, I'll write it and then I'll read it. It was really the reading impulse that got me into the writing thing. So this first book received less critical attention than many of her later novels, but it still generated positive initial reviews in general, including some very mainstream publications like the New York Times. One quote in the New York Times said, with the flaws and virtues tallied, I found myself still in favor of the bluest eye. There are many novelists willing to report the ugliness of the world as ugly. The writer who can reveal the beauty and the hope beneath the surface is a writer to seek out and to encourage. Another of you said, I have said poetry, but the bluest eye is also history, sociology, folklore, nightmare, and music. And despite some positive reviews, others were very critical, and Tony was disappointed in how the book was initially received in general. In the afterword that she wrote for the 1993 edition of the novel, Morrison said that the initial publication of The Bluest Eye was like the character Piccola's life, dismissed, trivialized, and misread. The Bluest Eye has gone on to become a major text and touchstone in African American literature. It is widely taught in schools and colleges across the world. In the year 2000, Oprah chose it as a selection for her book club, and 800,000 copies of the book were sold. Um, along with this, in Austria in 2006, the city of Vienna distributed 100,000 free copies of the book in its annual One Town, One Book event. And this remains one of Morrison's most influential novels. And then we have Sula. So in 1973, Morrison published her second novel, Sula, which focuses on two Black women from childhood into adulthood. It examines the dynamics of friendship as well as community. And the reviews for Sula were, <laughs> were generally positive overall. One review said, it is one of the finest books I have read in some time. Another said, beauty, eccentricity, bustle, laughter, sensuality, generous affection. Toni Morrison's novels evoke such qualities only to reduce them to shadows through the bleak light of unremitting irony. In 1975, Sula was nominated for the National Book Award as well. However, there was a very prominent New York Times review by a woman named Sarah Blackburn which has some problematic views. So in her article, she argues that Morrison is much too talented to remain only a marvelous recorder of the Black side of provincial American life. If she is to maintain the large and serious audience she deserves, then she is going to have to address a riskier contemporary reality than this. So at the time, books were primarily written by white people, about white people, and intended for a white audience. And Morrison was challenging that with her work. But Blackburn was implying that in order to appeal to a serious white audience, she should write about white people instead of Black people. And this statement really shows the typical white attitude towards Black writers at the time. Um, Clarence Major, a writer and painter, said in response to this review from Blackburn, for a long time, white readers and critics have tried to dictate what Black writing should be. So many criticized Blackburn's review and sang their praises for Tony's work. So then we have Song of Solomon, her third novel, which was published in 1977. 
And this is about a Black man in search of his identity, as well as the stories of generations of his family before him. This was Morrison's first book to feature a male protagonist, and it was her most ambitious novel to date. And this book was really her breakthrough success, both critically and commercially. This was the book that really catapulted her into mainstream literature consciousness. This really put her on the map. Song of Solomon won the National Book Critics Circle Award, and it was also the first book by a Black woman author to have been chosen for the Book of the Month Club, which helped to make it a bestseller. And this is one of her most widely taught novels in colleges and universities. Here are a couple reviews for Song of Solomon. It says, so marvelously orchestrated that Morrison's narrative, that it not only excels on all of its respective levels, not only works for all of its interlocking components, but also, in the end, says something about life and death for all of us. And another review said, the first two thirds of Song of Solomon are merely wonderful. The last 100 pages are a triumph. So prior to publishing Song of Solomon, people had been encouraging Tony to quit her editing job and give her time and energy to writing instead. And the success of Song of Solomon helped convince her to leave Random House. Another factor was mounting frustration she had with the publishing world. So these include things like white supremacy, conglomeration, and the push for books to be as profitable as possible. And the books that Morrison wanted to publish by Black writers weren't necessarily profitable, or not as profitable as the publishing houses wanted them to be. So after almost two decades at Random House, she left in 1983 to be a full-time writer. She didn't call herself a writer until this point, even after publishing three successful books. She moved into a converted boathouse on the Hudson River and focused all of her time on writing. However, she also managed to teach a few English classes during this time at the State University of New York and Rutgers University as well. So then we have Beloved. This is possibly her most well-known well and acclaimed book. This is her next huge success. It was published in 1987, but the seed of this book had been planted over a decade ago. While she was working at as an editor at Random House, one of the nonfiction projects that she worked on was called The Black Book. This was compiled by Tony, and it's kind of like an illustrated scrapbook of sorts. Um, it spans three centuries of Black history. So it includes things like newspaper clippings, photos, advertisements, things like that. And so while Tony is researching for this book, she came across a 19th century article about a runaway slave named Margaret Garner. And Garner was at the point of being recaptured near Cincinnati when she made the decision to kill her young daughter to spare her a life of slavery. And there was a subsequent trial that was very complicated and convoluted and the main debate was about whether Garner could be tried for murder or the equivalent of destruction of property because enslaved people were defined as property at this time. So this story became the inspiration for a beloved almost a decade later. And this is a story of a formerly enslaved woman named Seppa, the ghost of her baby who haunts her home and her family, and a strange teenage girl who shows up calling herself beloved. So it examines the destructive legacy of slavery while also chronicling Seppa's life, which is filled with so much trauma, but also with love. Beloved was an instant hit and was on the New York Times bestseller list for 25 weeks straight. And this book really marked an incredible turning point in the literary world because it urged readers to see slaves as human beings, as individuals. So people couldn't think of slavery the same way after reading Beloved. This book is simultaneously moving yet horrifying. Um, A.S. Byatt said, this novel gave me nightmares and yet I sat up late, paradoxically smiling to myself with intense pleasure at the exact beauty of the singing prose. And Margaret Atwood wrote, Miss Morrison's versatility and technical and emotional range appear to know no bounds. If there were any doubts about her stature as a preeminent American novelist of her own or any other generation, Beloved will put them to rest. 
When talking about Beloved, Morrison said, this is the gift of a novel. No other art form allows us to enter and thereby dignify the inner life of another human being so thoroughly, allows us to experience the inner life of another human being, the secret inner life, what it is that that person feels, not their opinions, not their social conditions, but what did it feel like to be that person? Beloved lets us feel what it's like to be Setha, the mother. It allows us to provide her life and lives like hers with respect, with dignity. Despite the acclaim that Beloved received, it didn't win the National Book Award or the National Book Critics Circle Award. And because of this, 48 Black writers and literary critics published a letter of protest in the New York, New York Times Book Review. So this letter expressed their gratitude for Tony and the meaning of her work, while also critiquing the lack of awards that had been given to her. The letter said, despite the international stature of Toni Morrison, she has yet to receive the national recognition that her five major works of fiction entirely deserve, yet to receive the Keystone Honors of the National Book Award or the Pulitzer Prize. And this worked, or at least played a role in working, because two months later, in 1988, Morrison was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved. And here you can see a screenshot of that letter. You can see near the bottom right are the names of all of the people who signed off on the letter in support of Tony. Beloved was also made into a movie by Oprah. Um, in an interview, Oprah said that she was so desperate to get in touch with Tony after she finished reading Beloved that she actually called the fire department in Tony's town to get her phone number, which Tony wasn't a big fan of at the time. But Oprah was able to get in touch with Tony, and she gushed about the book and said that she wanted to make Beloved into a movie. And Tony was um, initially very hesitant about this, but her son Slade encouraged her saying that she would always have the book and the movie would just be another version of her work. The movie took 10 years to produce and was released in 1998, and Oprah stars as the main character, Setha. Unfortunately, the movie was a flop at the box office, but Morrison's novel remained extremely successful. And Oprah went on to select four of Morrison's novels over six years for her book club. She was a huge Toni Morrison fan. So the four books that I've talked about are Tony's most well-known, but there are many additional fiction books that we haven't discussed. Tony continued writing for the rest of her life. She published books from 1970 all the way up until 2015. So um, we have this one in the bottom left corner, Paradise, that was burnt, well, sorry, it was banned in several prisons for the fear that it could start a riot. And Morrison said, and I thought, how powerful is that? I could tear up the whole place. The final book that she published was God Help the Child in 2015. This was published four years before she died. And she also wrote nonfiction. So here are just some of her nonfiction books. Most of her nonfiction work was adapted from lectures and speeches that she gave over time. Um, so we have what moves at the margins, selected nonfiction, and the source of self-regard, selected essays, speeches, and meditations. But she also wrote a work of literary criticism, examining the presence of Black characters in white American literature. And that was in Playing in the Dark, Whiteness, and the Literary Imagination. She also wrote some general reflections on themes that preoccupy her work. So things like race, fear, and the desire to belong in the origin of others. She also wrote various essays and forewords in a number of books. And then she wrote even more. She co-wrote a number of children's books with her son Slade. You can see a couple of the titles up here. One of them is called Who's Got Game? Another is called Please Louise. She also wrote a children's nonfiction book called Remember the Journey to School Integration. And this explores the hardships that Black students face <clears throat> when they were being integrated into public schools. This book won the Coretta Scott King Award in 2005. She only wrote one short story. It was called Recetatif, 
and it explores racial identity while making the reader the subject of her experiment. So you know that one character is white and one is black, but you don't know which is which. And so it forces the readers to examine their assumptions and their biases, and it's just fantastic. Um, it's about 60 pages. I would really recommend that. In 2002, she also wrote the libretto for Margaret Garner, which is an opera about the same story that inspired her book, Beloved. She also wrote two plays, one of which was called Dreaming Emmett, about the murder of Emmett Till, and she also wrote a collection of poetry. So like I mentioned earlier, most of the books that were written during Toni Morrison's time were written by white people, about white people, and for white people. And so Morrison was challenging this notion by writing about Black people and not catering to white readers. She was also combating the narrative of white universalism, which is the idea that the white person's story is the only story that exists. And Morrison said, the assumption is that the reader is a white person, and that troubled me. They were never talking to me. Some critics degraded her writing, saying things like, Beloved was a fraud. It was a fake depiction of the slave trade. I found one quote that even said, I hope this prize inspires her to write better books. Some thought that she didn't deserve any prizes, that she was racist, and that her books were melodramatic. Other critics accused her of not being able to write about white people, and some said she'd have to eventually mature and write about real things. In response to this, Morrison said, as though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze, I have spent my entire writing life trying to make sure the white gaze was not the dominant one in any of my books. And Tony said she didn't want to speak for Black people, but to speak to and among Black people. Tony was constantly labeled as a Black woman writer throughout her career, and Tony said that she liked the label, except when people said her work was good for a Black writer instead of just good. She was also very supportive of anyone reading her work. She wanted everyone to be exposed to the kinds of themes and depths and trauma that she was addressing in her books. So while it was um, intended to speak to Black people, it was really meant for everyone. Everyone can get something out of her work. Morrison said, I'm writing for Black people in the same way that Tolstoy was not writing for me, a 14-year-old colored girl from Lorraine, Ohio. I don't have to apologize or consider myself limited because I don't write about white people, which is absolutely not true. There are lots of white people in my books. The point is not having the white critic sit on your shoulder and approve it. So despite her critics, Morrison's work was widely recognized and celebrated through various awards. If I listed every award that she has won, we would truly be here all day. So here are just some of her most prestigious awards. Morrison became the first Black woman to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. She was also chosen by the National Endowment for the Humanities to give the Jefferson Lecture, which is the U.S. government's highest honor of achievement. She was named a living legend by the Library of Congress. She was awarded nearly a dozen honorary doctorate degrees. The New York Times Book Review named Beloved the best American work of fiction in the previous quarter century. She was also awarded the US Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama. And this is the highest civilian award in the US. And she was also inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Here are some reflections on her writing life. Um, in one interview, Morrison recalled a time when she was working at Random House and she made a list of everything that she needed to do. So this was tasks relating to work, to family, and writing. But then she made another list of everything she needed to do to live. And the only two things on that list were, one, to mother her children, and two, to write. Writing was so essential to Tony and her life. For almost all of her writing career, she got up at 4 a.m. to write. Um, even when her kids were grown and she didn't work in publishing anymore, 
she said that she loved that time of day and was smarter in the morning. She would write for three to four hours every morning. She was constantly jotting down ideas, like when she was cooking or stuck in traffic. Um, in one interview, she told a story about one of her sons spitting up on the paper that she was writing on. And she said, I wrote around the puke because I figured I could always wipe that away, but I might not get that sentence again. So although Tony never returned to publishing, she did return to teaching later in life in 1989 after she published Beloved to critical acclaim. She was appointed as the Robert Goheed Chair of Humanities at Princeton, where she taught a creative writing class. And in this class, she encouraged students to write outside of their own experiences instead of writing what they knew, as students were commonly instructed at this time. She remained on the faculty at Princeton until 2006, although she didn't teach many regular classes there after 2000. She officially retired from teaching in 2006, but she continued to lecture widely. Toni Morrison changed the literary landscape and she did it on her terms. She wrote a world in which white people were largely absent, which was groundbreaking at the time. She also challenged the typical writing style by forcing the reader to really slow down and linger on her words and what she was saying. But through her books, Toni really transformed history into literary art. It was grounded in historical facts, but her books were given life through her characters and her storytelling. And a writer named Farrah Griffin said, Toni looks into the face of historical suffering of African Americans, looks inside their heart and finds a language to express that. And Toni forced people to see the story beneath the widespread narrative. She showed how America existed and still exists for Black people. And Morrison's work has inspired generations of writers to follow in her footsteps. And additionally, her work as an editor brought countless Black voices to the world. Here's one more quote from Farrah Griffin. She said, it gave me a world of language to escape to, but also a world I recognized as a young Black woman in a working class community. It showed me the magic of my own world that I didn't see. After reading her, it was hard to see my own world in the same way. Morrison passed away on August. We'll go back to that in a second. She passed away in August. Um, on August 5th in 2019, at the age of 88 from complications of pneumonia. She was survived by her son, Harold Ford Morrison, and three grandchildren. Over 3,000 people gathered at her memorial in New York to celebrate her life. And several prominent speakers reflected on her as a friend, a mentor, a mother, and a woman. A close friend of hers named Fran Lebowitz said, Everyone knows what kind of writer Tony was, but not everyone knows what kind of friend Tony was. The editor, David Remnick, said, I once rang Tony to see if she might write something for The New Yorker. She said, I can't, honey, I'm baking a cake. Angela Davis said, what I value most among all of her many gifts is how she demonstrated a way of being in the world. She was always here and there at the same time totally present with you, but also creating new universes. And author Jasmine Ward said, she told us you are worthy to be seen, you are worthy to be heard, you are worthy to be sat with, to be walked beside. And now I have a video about four minutes long about Morrison's life and legacy. Um, uh... I didn't discover why I wrote uh, really until later, at the very beginning, when I wrote the first book, The Bluest Eye. I came at it as not a writer, but a reader. And such a story didn't exist. Uh, every little homely Black girl was a joke. 
or didn't exist in literature. And I was eager to read about a story where racism really hurts and can destroy you. You don't think you will ever change and write books that incorporate white white lives into them substantially? I have done. Mm. In a substantial way. You can't understand how powerfully racist that question is, can you? Because you could never ask a white author, when are you going to write about black people? Toni Morrison's prose brings us that kind of moral and emotional intensity that few writers ever attempt. Song of Solomon to Beloved, Tony reaches us deeply using a tone that is lyrical, precise, distinct, uh, and inclusive. There would never have been a book club had there not been you as an author. Really? No. So I thank you, oh, Ms. Morrison. This I is thank fabulous. You. Yes. <laughs> never would have been one without you. Never would have been. Well, you know, I'm trying not to write just because I can or just write more. I'm trying to write less that means more, that says more. For me, it's extremely important for the clarification, not only of the past, but of who we are as human beings in this country. I was editing a book at Random House, and it was a kind of scrapbook of all sorts of things that emanated from African American culture. And I came across this woman, Margaret Garner, and the story was that a slave woman had killed her children or tried to kill them all. What struck me was the theme was that she was not crazy. And they were stunned to find her a articulate, be sane, and three, interested in doing it again. I know how to write forever. I don't think I could have happily stayed here with the calamity that has occurred so often in the world if I did not have a way of thinking about it, past, present, future, which is what writing is for me. It's control. Nobody tells me what to do. I am in control. It is my world. It's sometimes wild process by which I arrive at something. But nevertheless, it's mine, it's free, and it, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's pure knowledge. You're welcome. All right. So in terms of books that you can get from the library by Toni Morrison, we have all of her fiction books that you can check out to read. We also have her short story, Recitative, and we have many of her nonfiction books and her children's books as well. We also have many um, nonfiction books that are written about Toni Morrison and her life and her work. We also have the movie Beloved, along with an incredible documentary called Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. I highly, highly recommend this if you're interested in learning more about Toni and hearing her speak about her life. It's fantastic. We also have several teen and children's nonfiction books about Toni Morrison so they can learn about her as well. So here are some of the databases that I use to put together this program. These are all free for you to access through the library with your library card. So I use historical newspapers, US major dailies, this has coverage of many national daily newspapers. 
This is where I got all of the photos of those New York Times reviews for her books. We also have the Biography Reference Center, and this has biographical profiles, essays, book reviews, and more on prominent figures. And then we also have African American History Online, which covers African American history from the 1400s to the present, along with many, many other databases that you can access for free with your library card. If you want to get in contact with the reference department, you can reach us by phone, email, we have a chat service. We also have book a librarian appointments where you can talk with a librarian one-on-one -on -one about a specific topic or how to use a specific database. But we are here to help, so please reach out if you have any questions, anything we can do for you. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to watch this with me today. Thank you so much. Have a good day.